This, as far as I understand, is intermediate macroeconomics. Thank you. Microphone being in trouble today, so we will, I'll shout at you. Hopefully you can hear me in the back more or less. I will work on the microphone so it's better in the future. Um, intermediate macroeconomics. A lot of you, I, I see a lot of faces that I recognize. Um, a lot of you have had me for introductory economics. Um, some of you haven't. Some of you are from other programs and whatnot, so not everyone has had me before, but, but here I am. Um, what do we got? We got me. This is me, Ivan Pasteen. I, there's an email for this class. There's 400 students, which is ridiculous, but it is the facts, and, and we have to, to deal with them. So for normal, everyday troubles, this is the email address. If there's an emergency, etc., you can email me directly. But if I'm getting 50 emails a day, you're going to get lost. So this is like a, a now it might take a couple days to get answered that way. But you know, you, those of you who have emailed me before know that that's not really worse than the way you get from the regular service. Um, but if you have an emergency, you're hit by a truck, your cat falls out of a tree, whatever, and you can't do something that you're supposed to do in a timely manner because of the something, please do get hold of me directly. Okay. Lectures will be live, just like this. I am going to do my very, very best to record them and give you decent recordings of them. You see, I'm working at it. But it's hit or miss, right? So I cannot guarantee you that there will be recorded lectures. Mostly there will be. I'm really hoping that I get all of them, but I can't technology be in the way it is and, you know, I can't guarantee it. But I do realize that housing is a ridiculous problem here and it's difficult for people. Um, so I'm going to do my very, very best. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully I can get you all of them. I will certainly try to get most. I'm, I'll try to get them. You know, we'll see how it goes. But I can't promise, right? Lectures are like this. This is what you're responsible for, for better or worse. Okay. You're responsible for everything covered in class. And we have a book. It's this book, Macroeconomics, a European Perspective. I'm not going to be following it particularly closely, for particularly the first half of the class. We're not hardly going to use it at all. But we'll be using it more as we go forward. All right. um, Grading, I'm going to get the grading stuff over with quickly because I hate it. You hate it. We all hate it together. Um, there's going to be tutorials. There is going to be a midterm exam. And there's going to be a final exam. And uh, the things are going to be broken down that way. Now, in the tutorials, what's going to happen is you're going to be given an assignment ahead of time. You're going to do the, the assignment. You are going to be graded based on whether you made an honest attempt. You will not be graded based on whether you got the right answer or not. But honest attempt. Okay. The midterm itself will be in the evening because it's 400 people. We have to have it out in miserable BlackRock. And so we all have to schlep out there in the rain and carry our boxes. Uh, it's, it's a pain for you. It's more for me because the boxes. But um, that's where we have to go. And so I'm arranging the, actually, at, at the moment, all, all your lecturers are arguing with each other who gets what day to have their exams on. Um, so I believe it will be week seven, which is right before the break. I've asked for the Thursday night right before the break, but we will see what happens. OK, tutorials. You're going to have a scheduled tutorial every other week. Right? You have it on your schedule. You're signed up for a particular one. It's on your schedule. It's a 50-minute thing, roughly 30 people or so in that. And that is particularly because people are shy to ask questions in 400 people classes. I wish you weren't. I wish people were asking all their dumb questions here. They're never as dumb as you think they are. If you have it, I can guarantee at least 30%, probably more like 80% of everyone else has it too. Um, so please do ask here. But I know some people are shy. So we have these to get in a smaller group. There are experienced PhD students that are, that are doing these. They, they know stuff. that They will be able to help you. But of course, they're not sitting in class, so it may take them a, a few minutes to get up to speed. Um, but, but they will be able to help you with whatever questions you have. And plus, they'll have some exercises to do and, and, and whatnot as well. But the main reason that is there is for questions. So you know, they're going to have some stuff that they're supposed to do. 
But that stuff is much less important than answering your questions. Your questions have priority both here and also in the, in the tutorials. Okay. You have to attend the one that you're enrolled in, though. And there's a whole bunch of them. There's a, you know, it's spread over two weeks. Everyone has a different little group. But it's really important that they stay small. And some are popular times, some are less popular times. And if everyone shows up at the same one, it doesn't work at all. It just becomes this in a little tiny room. So we have to enforce that you go to the, the proper one. Now, if there's some special circumstance, you can talk to your tutor, and, and it, it's possible. But we cannot have everyone going to the other one. You, we can't have anyone, like as a routine thing, going to another one. Right? Special circumstances, sure, we can work around it. But they only have the grading sheet for their own thing. So. Please go to the one you're enrolled in. Um, they won't start this week. They won't start next week. They will start the week after. Because there's no real point to have a tutorial on something that you haven't covered yet. We have to cover something before you can, can do anything in the tutorial, before I can give you any homeworks or anything. So week three is when they're starting. And so there'll be five tutorials all together. Okay. Okay. Now, this is, this is what I said before. There we go. Any questions on the, the unpleasant mechanics of the whole thing? Yeah? Uh, is the, MCQ the, the midterm will be an MCQ. The final will be a written. Yeah, that's a good question. I can guarantee you 99% of everyone had that same question. <laughs> yeah? No, the, on, on the schedule, it's, it's, has it down as... as you know, the automated schedule is going to look like it, but nothing is actually going to happen until week three. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so if you just look at the schedule, because they, they don't know anything about, when they make the schedule, they don't know anything about the actual class. And so they're unable to say, well, you know, they haven't covered anything, so what are we going to have a tutorial on? But, but we can do that. It's, it's pointless to have it this week. It's pointless to have it next week. So we start in week three. Okay. What's going to be in the class? Um, I'm going to list a few things. They're going to mean absolutely nothing to you because, of course, you haven't had them yet. But we're going to cover the Phillips curve. That's where we're going to start. Okay. People, I, I see people that have seen Phillips curve elsewhere. Well, well it'll be a great joy for you. Okay. The Lucas critique is where we're going with the Phillips curve. Um, adaptive and rational expectations. This is going to be the big chunk. Is this thing working? Yeah, this thing is not really working. Huh, what's with that? OK. This is going to be the big chunk of the first half of the class, is adaptive and rational expectations. Um, it is going to be something very different from anything you've seen so far. It is going to be math, 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 and then there's going to be a little bit of math thrown in for, for good measure. So very, very different from a first year material. Um, and so you know, uh, have to be ready for that. Psychologically, like is there's nothing that you don't know how to do, like math-wise, but it's going to be relentless. And so, you know, that's the thing. Okay. Then after, probably is like after the break, we'll do intertemporal decisions in closed and open economies, economic policy and open economy. I am a theorist. I do not honestly care about economic policy that much. You will have all your other macroeconomics courses going forward will be very policy oriented, like our our macroeconomics guru, um, um, Carl Whelan, he is very policy oriented. And so I am your chance to get a very theory oriented class. And I am going to revel in it and enjoy it. And you guys just have to suffer. And that's just, you know, or enjoy it too. I, I don't know. But, but it's going to be a very theory oriented class. So we will not spend a lot of time on policy. But we will spend quite a bit of time on open economy. Because of course, Ireland is a small country. Imports and exports for us are really important. Foreign direct investment for us is very important. Um, and so clearly, you know, everything we've done so far last year has been thinking of the economy as a, sort of a closed system. But in fact, there's a rest of the world. And for Ireland, that's particularly a big deal. right? And so we need to start talking about that. Okay. And Flexible and fixed exchange rates. Fixed exchange rates is my little claim to fame in macroeconomics. So of course, I'm going to want to drone on about that. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. More importantly, though, 
is how we're going to go about this and what the course is going to feel like. Because I can list these things to you, and that's great, but it's a bunch of words that you don't particularly know and you don't particularly know what it means until you cover it. But what's coming up for you in terms of how the class is going to feel is, as I say, we're going to be talking about things where we're talking about people's expectations in involving environments. So we have things are going to be very often changing over time. Right, so the models we had so far tended to be fairly static models. Certainly the Keynes and Cross diagram was entirely st static. It was just in a, in a fixed, you know, in the short run where prices don't change. So there was no real changing going on in the economy. Um, we did do aggregate supply, aggregate demand, where there was a notion between the short run and the long run. But we don't, don't really, we, we've put on some stuff about how things evolved. But it wasn't really precise, and it wasn't really super. I mean, we could tell stories, but we couldn't be entirely sure that our stories were correct because we needed to say, how do people form their expectations of inflation in that environment? Remember, people set their wages based on what they expected inflation to do. So this expectation thing was very important, and we want to spend a lot more time talking about how expectations form in a changing environment. And so it's going to be particularly problematic to do this entirely in terms of graphs. Right? We can do it in terms of graphs. It's not like graphs are impossible. But as the graphs become more, more complicated, you know on a two-dimensional graph, we can basically graph two things. Right? We have one thing, and we got the other thing. And then when anything else changes, the lines shift. Right? We've seen that over and over again. But when we start having, just suppose we had inflation and, and output as our two things. Great, we got inflation and output. We can graph that. But we're going to have inflation and output today. We're going to have inflation and output next year. We're going to have inflation and output the year after that. So even though we only have two things that we're interested in, it becomes six things really quick when we start talking about it moving over time. And this is really hard to do on a two-dimensional graph. Now we can do it, we can certainly give us graphs to help us think about it, but we're never going to be totally sure that we're doing it right because we're forcing six dimensions onto a two-dimensional graph. And so a lot of it is, oh, I think this is going to change, therefore I shift the graph. Well, why did you shift, think those things were change, going to change? Is that consistent with your shifting of the graph? It becomes very complicated and it can be done correctly. But as you're doing it, it's never all that, you're never all that certain that you're doing it correctly. Right? Um, and so mathematics is lovely because mathematics doesn't care how many dimensions we have. Right? We can have two dimensions, output and inflation. We can have five dimensions, add more. We just add more equations. It gives us more dimensions. And math forces us to think about things extremely logically. So we can't be missing a step. We can't accidentally forget about something or think one thing affects another thing, but we're actually wrong. Right? If we can tell our story in a mathematical way, we're forced to think extremely logically about it. And that is why math is such a big deal in theoretical economics. You, know, you guys that are doing econometrics and whatnot, you've seen it in, in, or will be seeing it in other forms when you're doing empirical stuff. And it seems natural that we're dealing with numbers, math is going to show up. But in theory, it's very important too as a way of forcing us to think logically about it, forcing us to be very clear about what we're assuming about the world. Right? When we draw these lines, we say, oh, we're assuming this, but we don't really, we can't be certain that that's all we're assuming when we draw that line. Whereas if we draw it in math, we know exactly what we're, we do it in math, we know exactly what we're assuming, and we know that we're thinking logically about it. We know if, if we put in enough information, we know if we put in too much, it's going to tell us that, it's going to spit that out at us. And so way back in the day, like you know, the 20s and 30s, way, way back in the ancient times, 20s and not these 20s, like the other 20s, like 100 years ago, right? 100 years ago, everything was done more or less the way you did it in first year. We, we drew graphs, we told stories. The graphs became more complicated, they became, became more intricate, they became more sophisticated, but it was all done in graphs and stories, the way, way we've had it up till now. And then after World War II, there was a revolution in, in theoretical economics where they started putting everything in terms of math. 
and trying to, to force themselves to think extremely logically about it. And it turned out that a lot of the things that were done before the war were just wrong or were missing something. They seemed right, like really, really smart people worked really hard on them and, it, and they felt like it was right, but it wasn't. Okay? Some of them were right, of course, like, you know, they're very smart people, like they come up with right things too. But when you start forcing, putting math on it, you can ask questions that are difficult to answer otherwise, and you know that you're getting the correct answer for the things that you put in. Right? You're, still on, you're still on the hook for the assumptions that you're making, but you know what assumptions they are, and you know that you've thought logically about it. Okay? So we typically have three ways of thinking about any theoretical problem. We've got a story, we've got a graph, and we've got math. And they all three have to be working together. Right? If you just have math and you've learned nothing, right? you, you find an answer, right? you don't know why, you learn nothing. Right? Um, but you want your, your math and your story. Story always tends to be a little loose. You're not quite sure that it's consistent with the math, but it feels consistent with the math. And then you put it with the graph, and you, you see how the things interact. You put all three of them together. You've got three ways to think about it. This is how, how we're going to try to do it. But what you guys haven't seen yet is the math. So we are going to, in this class, be using algebra all the time. We won't go much beyond algebra. We might use calculus here and there to a derivative, and I will remind you what derivatives are. I know it's been, you know, been a while since you, you've seen them and loved them, but um, mostly it's just going to be straight up algebra. Two equations, two unknowns, one equation, one unknown. Plug this equation into that equation. All going to be basically linear, so there's not going to be a lot of other stuff other than linear stuff. But it is going to be relentless. It is going to be absolutely and totally relentless. That's what the course is going to look like. Okay. Yeah, joy. I see so much joy. I see boredom. I see sleepiness. Yeah. Anyway, wh whatever you got, that's what you got, because that's what's coming. Okay. Um, none of it is beyond your ability. None of it is super hard. But it is endless. Everything is. All our stories are going to be told in mathematics, almost all. Not the very first bit, but later on, all the stories are going to be done in terms of mathematics, and we need to be able to see that math as a story. And that, I think, a lot of people have, have trouble with. I know I had trouble with it when I was just starting. That you think, okay, I have a story. I understand what a story is. I've got these equations. I understand what equations are. Some people will take some reminding what equations are. But seeing the equations as a story took quite a while to come up with. So we're going to be a bit relentless on it. Because first of all, it's super important, um, and it forces us to think logically, and also because it takes a while before you start seeing them as stories rather than seeing them as you know x, y, and z. Okay. Okay. So this traditionally is students one of the like in UCD one of their least favorite classes. Yay! I, I, is that great to hear? Yeah, I'm so happy. Um, so what things? things do people not like about this course? So many of the sections, particularly in the first half, will not particularly follow the book. So there's that. If you're, if you're very book oriented, that can be a challenge. Right? The students don't like that. There's lots of math, lots and lots and lots and lots of math. Many, many, well, the vast majority of students hate that. They hate it forever. They, you know, yeah, back into that. My terrible handwriting and spelling you will definitely dislike, unless you, you know, pity me or make fun of me, either way. But, but yeah, you're not going to like it. Um, and a different method of studying is required. If you have things, ways that work for you that are incompatible with this, they will probably not work here. Right? If you have flashcards and you're memorizing stuff for class, that will, I won't say definitely, because people are super skilled at memorizing, but my god, it will be hard. Like, it will be yeah, atrocious. So you will have to have a different way of studying for this, particularly if you're flashcard oriented. It will, I won't say, I want to say it won't work. Some people will make it work. Obviously, there's always someone, but, but yeah, it won't work. Okay. So you won't like that. So previous people that have had not this class, but class covering the same material that I taught before, some quotes from previous students, anonymous on the internet, so I don't know who they are. Oh, I get my suspicions. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, do we have more? Yes, we have more. <laughs> this, one, this one's not quite as hyperbolic, but same idea. And no way you can get through the homeworks without having the answer sheet beside me at all times and looking at it every two seconds. This is absolutely fair. Okay. The homeworks are not something that you can just breeze into and woo, they're done. No, you're going you're gonna to sit down with the homework. You're going to get stuck on line two. You're going to have no idea whatsoever what to do with it. You're going to get the answer key. You're going to look at the answer key. It's going to take you 10 minutes to get through the first two lines. And what the hell is going on there? And it's going to be like that. Right? Now, by the end, you'll be breezing through it. But at the beginning, or if you don't study and you get to the exam, you will not be able to do it. But you will not be able to do the exam unless you study. And if you study, it is going to be slow going at first. I promise you it will get better, but it will be slow going at first. Okay. Here's, here's an example of the notes, just so you, know, you can see what he's going on about. I assume it's he. I don't know. I don't know why I do. Because I, I think I know who it is. A nice kid, actually. But I don't know. It's years ago, years ago, so it doesn't really matter. He's off you know, being vice president of PricewaterhouseCoopers or something. I don't know what he's up to. OK. Things you might like. I don't know if people like it. I like it. I, I enjoy the course, so you know, you're on your own. But, but things you might like about it, the things I like about it anyway, you actually get to learn something new. You will know at the end things that you do not know now. And that, that can be nice. It's painful to learn. It is always painful to learn. It is never easy to learn something new. But at the end, if you learn it, I promise it will be something new that you don't know now. Okay? So there's that. I don't know if it's something new that's useful to you or you're interested or anything like that, but I know you don't know it now and you will then. Okay? So we got that. Okay? The stuff you learn reflects how professional economists go about analyzing problems, professional macroeconomics these days. It's not the full-blown thing that, that you know, you're doing if you're working on one problem for 20 years, but it is, will give you the spirit about what theoretical economists do. Okay? And even though you can't just use your, your flashcards, there is a straightforward way to learn it. If you go through the thing and you, you, know, you get stuck at line two and you spend your 10 minutes getting to line three, and then you go through the whole thing, and then you go back, and the next time it takes you five minutes to get from line two to line three, and you just go through this, by the end, you will know it. I, I, I'm promising this, but I think it's true. I, I, it's, it's hard to promise for someone else, but I believe this is true, and in the past it has seemed to be true, that if you go and do the thing, you can learn it. Okay? It is not an easy thing, but it is a straightforward thing. It won't feel that as you're doing it, but what you're supposed to do, you will know what you're supposed to do. Doing it, a bit harder, but you will know what you're supposed to do to get from A to B. This is my hope and intention. Okay? And hopefully, and this is what I've been told in the past for, for the material, but you know, I, again, I can't guarantee the future, but my intention is that nothing will come as a surprise. That if you've been doing, you know, obviously if you never look at the material, everything's going to be a shock when you get to the exam. But if you've been looking at the material and you've been working on it and you've been doing the thing, when the exam comes, you will not be surprised by the question. I mean, you won't know it ahead of time, but you'll know the kind of question it's going to be and you'll know how to analyze it and it should hopefully be straightforward. Okay? My intention, past experience, we will see what happens this term, but this is, this is the goal. So here we got the same students at the end of the semester. Let's see what they have to say. Same three people. Yeah, see, they said it was OK. It was a third year class that time. Um, nobody said I was wonderful, by the way. They just said, oh, I could tolerate it at the end. But they, they could tolerate it at the end. And that's the important thing. The important thing is that I'm wonderful. I should be wonderful. No, apparently not. Okay. OK, questions about the course in a general sort of way, specific sort of way? Anything else? OK, then let's get started with the Phillips curve. We have time. How are we doing? 
We do. Here we go. This is the Phillips curve. It is covered in chapter nine. For those of you who have my book from back from last year, it's covered in chapter 28. Now we are going to go beyond what they say in chapter nine. We're not gonna do the math. Actually, after all that going on and on how we're gonna do math, we're gonna skip the math that they do in, in chapter nine because we've got other fish to fry here. But, and of course the principles book doesn't talk about math at all. Um, the principles book talks a little bit more about equilibrium than they do in, in our book. So I'm gonna be talking about equilibrium a bit, so that, that's a thing. But yeah, they exist in those places. Okay. So the, the Phillips curve is an empirical relationship. A bunch of guys hanging out with data, wasting their lives running regressions. They, they well, well, actually one guy, Phillips, way back in the day, I think it was the 30s, he did this. And he, he said, what do we say? Ah, 58, okay, never mind. Yeah, I never, never accept <laughs> dates from me, I'm always wrong. 1958, Mr. Phillips was hard at work. Probably did the work in 57, published it in 58. Um, he looked at unemployment and inflation, right? And so unemployment is something that we're, we're definitely concerned about, like unemployment, not good, right? We don't want an economy where lots of people can't find work. We would like an economy where you, you all graduate from university and jobs are just lined up waiting for you. This would be great. Um, and so we don't want you to be sitting around for 10 years unemployed, that's bad. So unemployment, bad, right? We're, we're, we're okay with that, yeah, unemployment, by and large bad, certainly cyclically unemployment is bad. Okay? And he was looking at this compared to inflation. Now the data way back when was very bad. So he was looking at particular in terms of wage inflation and he had particular types of unemployment because he couldn't measure everything and all that. He did the best he could. Okay? And he had 100 years of data, so quite a lot of data. He did it for the UK, I believe. And he found a strong negative relationship. That is higher inflation is associated with lower unemployment. Okay. Well, there you go. We have an empirical relationship. Good for us. Okay. And it turned out that this kind of made the news and everyone said, huh, well, what the heck? So they looked at it and they looked at it for different countries. They looked at it from different times. They looked at it in different ways of measuring inflation, different ways of measuring unemployment. They looked at it everywhere it was like an entire industry. Economists getting tenure, keeping employed for years on this little cash cow. Right? They're analyzing, analyzing, analyzing it. Always the same result. In terms of macroeconomics, it is probably the strongest empirical result we have ever found. That is, high inflation is associated with low unemployment, low inflation associated with high unemployment. Robust to everywhere, all the time, no matter how we look at it, no matter when we look at it. Glorious. A triumph of the empirical people, those bastards. Okay. So here's 1948 to 69 for the US. Um, there you go. Nice high, high inflation associated with low unemployment. Low inflation associated with high, un high unemployment. There you go. Okay. Lovely. Gorgeous. You can all go home. Empirical people have spoken, that's the facts. Theoreticians just have to deal with it. Suck it up, buddy. Well, then, oh, here we go. Here we're gonna write it this way. We're gonna, because we're theoreticians, we don't want all those little data points. We're just gonna draw a downward sloping curve like this. Okay. Now, I have cheated slightly here because this is our Phillips curve, a curve named after Mr. Phillips, and I have Put SRPC, PC, Phillips curve, good to go. Um, SR, for those of you who had introductory macroeconomics, that suggests short run. And so we're gonna have a short run Phillips curve here, which is where the theoreticians are gonna come involved. But at the moment, it's just a Phillips curve. We ran the numbers, we looked at how the real world works. Screw the theorists. This is how the world actually works. It works this way everywhere, it works this way all the time. 
There we go. High inflation, low unemployment. Okay, good to go. Okay. So before the 1970s, right, the Phillips curve was intellectually interesting. Like it was like a great empirical relationship. But it wasn't actually useful. There was nothing you could really do about that, right? Because you really couldn't say, do much about inflation, right? We have a relationship between inflation and unemployment, and that's lovely to know that we're going to have to trade, that the two are traded off against it, but we can't exploit that. We can't make use of that because we are on the gold standard or the Bretton Woods or some, some mechanism that ties our hands. So we can't just control the money supply. So inflation is not something that's under our control because we've tied our money to gold. And we can only have as much money as there is gold, right? in one form or another. Obviously very convoluted in the post-war period, but still you couldn't just print as much money or as little money as you want, wanted to. It was through the Bretton Woods Agreement tied to the amount of gold that was in Fort Knox. Right? And so there you are. You know that if you increase, in, if inflation increases, unemployment will go down, but you don't really have any mechanism to, inc to play around with inflation. So it's just, you know, now you know what's going to happen. If inflation is high, we're going to have low unemployment. If inflation is low, we're going to have high unemployment. But all that's just kind of random noise. It's not something that you have control over because you're tied into this Bretton Woods agreement. And we will see more of this at the end of the semester when we talk about fixed exchange rates. But after 1972, remember Nixon took us off the gold standard, and so the whole world is all of a sudden can print as much or as little money as they want. And so after that, we don't have any connection to gold anymore for the vast majority of countries, vast majority of people on the planet. And so it's all fiat money. It's just little slips of paper that we agree has value, and it only has value because we agree it has value. Right? And we can print as many of these little slips of paper, as few of these little slips of paper as we want. And so now, all of a sudden, for the first time in history, we can exploit the Phillips curve. We can say, aha, if we want unemployment lower, all we've got to do is increase inflation. Because we have this relationship, this extremely powerful relationship, that always holds in every country and every time period, no matter how we measure it. We're golden. We now have power to control the unemployment rate. Right, by changing inflation. Print more money, eventually we're going to get inflation, unemployment should come down. Right. Okay. Right. Well, here is the same data, US since 1970, and it doesn't look so good. I, mean, I don't know good, but it is certainly, it's not obvious that you can just draw a line through it the same way, right? So this Phillips curve thing disappeared. It was holding for hundreds of years. It was holding for every country. And then after 1970, poof, it's gone. And it's not just the US. Wherever we measure it, Phillips curve is gone. Okay. Recently, more recently, it's coming back a little bit due to, to, to the policies that central banks are pursuing, which we'll talk about in a bit. But, but for 1970, 1980, 1990, just gone, just absolutely gone. So as theoreticians, which, is, which we all are in this class, we need to explain this. Why was it around for so long? And why did it disappear? And more generally, is there anything we can learn outside of this, like more generally than just this Phillips curve, about empirical relationships? And that's the Lucas critique, See, taking this information and seeing if we can learn something about doing empirical work in general from this. Okay. Okay. So what's going on? Oh. I, I didn't talk about the shifts. That makes no sense. Okay. So what, the way we're going to understand this is the same way we understood the short run aggregate supply curve. It's going to be exactly the same story. I know 95% of you have seen the short run aggregate supply curve. 5% of you haven't seen the short run aggregate supply curve. Not to worry. It's a simple story. Okay. The simple story is, what do we got? is about short-run labor contracts. And in particular, here we want to be focusing on labor. When we did short-run aggregate supply, we talked about other inputs to production. But now, since we're talking about unemployment, we're talking really about labor. 
people working. And so we're really talking about wage contracts here. The input of production that we're concerned about is labor, so wage is the price of labor. Right? Right. So firms and workers, they come together. They agree on what the wages should be. Right? They pick a nominal wage, that is a money value wage. You're going to get 15 euros an hour. You agree with your boss on 15 euros an hour. And for a while, for the short run, however, you're going to be locked into that. That is, you're not going to renegotiate your wage every day. You're going to wait six months, a year, whatever, and then you're going to renegotiate your wage. So when you're deciding on your wage, both you and your boss care about what you think inflation is going to be. If inflation is really high, then your wage is going to be worth less to you at the end than it is at the beginning. And so you're going to want a bit more. You're going to demand 16 euros an hour, 17 euros an hour in order to get that. So the higher you expect inflation to be, the higher your wage is going to, nominal wage is going to be so that you can afford an apartment. Right? You've got to live somewhere. Okay. So if inflation ends up being just what we expected, we expected no inflation, we got our 15 euros an hour, at the end of the, the period, at the end of the year when we come to renegotiate our wages, we're still able to buy the same stuff we could at the beginning. Right? So our real wages, our real stuff that we can buy, what the firm is giving up in, in terms of stuff to hire us, that's just what it was at the beginning, okay? just what we expected. In which case, the firm is going to have the normal number of workers, because they're what they expected to pay for workers. And so the normal rate, the normal number of workers gives us the natural rate of unemployment. Remember, the natural rate of unemployment is, is misnamed. It is just the normal rate of unemployment. Okay? Really, we should just call it the normal rate. Unfortunately, for historical reasons, we're stuck with the jargon, the natural rate. But it's just normal. Right? The normal amount of unemployment is what we're going to get. And so, yeah, the natural rate of unemployment, if everything goes as expected. On the other hand, if inflation is higher than we expected, suppose, suppose prices doubled. We're getting our 15 euros an hour. We thought we could afford an apartment with that. But everything, including the price of apartments, doubles, 100% inflation. That means we're working for less in terms of real stuff. We can buy less with our wages at the end than we could at the beginning and less than we expected to be able to, to buy. Right? And firms are finding us really cheap because because they're only paying us 15 euros an hour, but their product price doubled. And so they find us really cheap, they hire more of us, and inflation is less than, um, unemployment is less than the natural rate. They hire more people. Right? It's less than normal. And likewise, inflation is lower than expected. They expected our wages to be eroded by inflation, but they weren't. And so they're starting to find us really expensive to hire because we're on these short-term contracts. And so they get rid of us. They make us work less hours, et cetera, et cetera. And unemployment ends up being higher than the normal amount. Okay? That's exactly the same story we told for the short-run Phillips curve. Exactly no difference whatsoever, except we're talking about unemployment instead of talking about output. Before, we were talking about the normal amount of output. Now we're talking about the normal amount of unemployment. So here's our short-run aggregate supply going through potential output. Here's our short-run Phillips curve going through unemployment. Okay? And what that means is that if we expect 5% unemployment, I'm sorry, 5% inflation, then we're going to get 5% wage increases. And if we actually get 5% inflation, everything's normal, it's as expected, and we get the natural rate of unemployment. Okay? On the other hand, if we expected 10% inflation, then we would have 10% wage increases. And if in inflation actually was 10%, everything's as expected, and we get the natural rate of unemployment. And again, for 15%. So as we, if we expect higher levels of inflation when we're making our contracts, we're going to have sh higher short-run Phillips curves. Okay. Exactly the same thing we did with short-run aggregate supply. That's why I'm moving th through it so fast. I, I took a week last time, but, but uh, I'm so bored. So bored of it. So I, I'm, I'm not now. I, and presumably you are too. I, I know it was a year ago or more for some of you, so uh, yeah. OK. OK. So that's going to be our theoretical background for this. And now we want to do something that we haven't done when we had um, the 
the short run aggregate supply. So it's, it's exactly the same story. We're just looking at it in terms of inflation instead of in terms of output. But now we want to start thinking about it in a bit different way. And we want to start thinking about what is a reasonable thing to expect inflation to be. Okay? We could have done it with the other model, but the Phillips curve is such a famous empirical relationship, we want to talk about it in terms of that. So we can talk about the empirics of it. And the way we're going to do this, and the last thing I'm going to talk about today, is the quantity theory of money. Um, and for this, we want to, I'm talking about the quantity theory of money because, first of all, we're going to use it later on. And secondly, it is a way to think about the connection between the amount of money that we print and the price level or inflation. Okay. So the quantity theory of this is this. This is M is the money supply. Okay. Think M1, M2, whatever your favorite M is. Pick one and, and be happy. The money supply. P is the price level, so how much do things cost? Okay. Y is real output. Okay. Very importantly, not nominal output. This is the real value of the stuff that's produced, which is also the stuff that's purchased, by the way. We're thinking closed economy here. Okay. And V is something new. V is the velocity of money. This is how fast money is moving. Right? This is actually it should be the speed of money because velocity is speed and direction and we got no direction here. It's just, but they call it the velocity because economists don't know physics. And um, the velocity of money, how fast is money moving? And so you can think, for example, that you get a euro and you have it sit under your bed for a year and then you spend it. Okay? And if everyone's doing that, the velocity of money is one. It's going around one time during the year. But what if you get the euro and it takes you six months to spend it? Okay. If it takes you six months to spend it, then you spend it, someone else has it. It takes them six months to spend it. It's gone around twice in the year. How many times does that same euro get spent in a single year? Okay. And so velocity, by definition, is just the price times y, so that's the total amount that got spent. We bought 10 things at 10 euros each. We spent 100 euros during the year. Divide it through by the number of euros there are, and that's how many times each euro went around. Right? If, there's, right, if there's 10, price is 10 and output is 10, there's 100, 100 euros got spent. If we have five euros all together for the economy, each euro got spent 20 times. And we can rewrite this as just the definition of velocity here. We haven't said anything new. We just set it in an equation. Um, but we can, can write it this way, multiplying by m, which is how you'll normally see it. The number of euros times the number of times they go around is equal to the total amount that got spent. Okay? Nothing insightful. We just define this new thing, velocity. This is just an accounting identity. There's no theory here. It's just how we define velocity, so we've learned nothing. Yeah, yes. Um, but we can turn it into a theory by adding just a little bit to it. Um, and the theory part says that for the short run, velocity is kind of determined by our society, like how accounts work and how easy it is to spend from your bank account and, and all that kind of stuff, how much stuff happens on the market versus off the market. It's pretty stable in the short run, according to this theory. People differ on this, but it's pretty stable in the short run. And Y is pretty stable in the short run. So say it's, it's at potential output. If both of those things are true, which there's huge disagreement on, um, to the extent that both of those things are, are true, so V is constant and Y is constant, then any change in M has to show up in P. Right? So if we double the money supply, we are going to double the price level. Right? So inflation in this story is completely controlled by how much money we print. Okay? Totally up to us. Now, nobody really thinks it's quite that one-to-one. -one, but some people think it, it, it's more one-to-one. -one. Some people think it's less one-to-one. -one. Right? It's sort of an extreme view. But you can see the connection there between the amount of money we, we print and the price level. And certainly in the long run, if we keep printing money, everybody agrees. Everybody, never everybody agrees on anything. But yeah, you know, every 
economist I've ever met agrees that, that yeah, if you keep printing money, prices are going to go up eventually, and probably quite a lot. Okay. All right. One last thing I want to say before, before I let you go is just an organizational issue that I forgot to say at the beginning, and that's um, computers in class. Some people find it extremely productive, and other people find it extremely distracting. Um, studies have shown that if you're sitting next to someone who's using a computer in class, that you retain less information. Other people find that if you're writing, you retain more information than if you're typing. I don't know. You do you. But what I want to do is make sure that there's a place that people can sit where they aren't distracted by computers. So what I'm going to do is these two, two blocks are going to be a no computer zone, and these three blocks will be the computer zone, and you can choose for yourself going forward where you want to sit. All right, see you next time. <laughs>